Thanks for joining us today on this edition of Arirang News. I'm Lee ji in Seoul. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un might be taking his first step abroad since taking power. And there he might even get to meet President Park Geun-hye for the first time ever. Russia has invited both President Park and Kim to attend their special anniversary event in May, possibly providing a chance for them to meet face to face. Our Son Jong-un, Son Jong-in starts us off. Will Russia serve as the venue for the leaders of the two Koreas to have their first face-to-face -face meeting during a key ceremony in May? The question arose after the North's leader Kim Jong-un gave a positive response to Russia's invitation to its World War II Victory Day ceremony, marking the 70th anniversary of its victory over Nazi Germany. The statement by Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov echoed an earlier announcement by President Vladimir Putin's foreign affairs advisor Yuri Ushakov that they had received the first signals from Pyongyang that Kim was planning to attend the festivities. Observers say Kim will likely leave his official decision until the last minute. As for South Korean President Park Geun-hye, who has also been invited, the presidential office of Chung Wa-dae says it's still looking into whether she will take up Russia's invitation and stress nothing has been decided yet. Watchers say that if the two Korean leaders both attend the ceremony, they could potentially exchange words for the first time. Moscow has invited many global leaders to the celebrations. So far, around 20 heads of state, including Chinese President Xi Jinping, have reportedly confirmed their attendance. At the 60th anniversary in 2005, then-South Korean President Noh Moo-hyun attended the ceremony, along with leaders from more than 50 countries, including the U.S., China and Japan. But then-North Korean leader Kim Jong-il was a no-show. If Kim Jong-un goes, it will be his first overseas trip since coming to power in 2011. It would also mark the first time a North Korean leader has chosen to go to another country before China. Son Jong-in, Arirang News. And despite North Korea's earlier offer for talks to the United States, the U.S. is responding to that offer with a big no. U.S. State Department spokesperson Jen Psaki said Wednesday that it doesn't really make a difference whether or not North Korea has offered to talk without any preconditions because Washington doesn't tolerate threatening rhetoric or empty proposals. She also said that Washington's position on North Korea will remain the same and that North Korea would need to abide by their international obligations first. The statement comes after the North's chief nuclear envoy met with former U.S. diplomats in Singapore this week. The Korean government wants to bring about reforms that would encourage students to pursue their talents and help women to take a more active role in the, work in the workforce. Here's our Park ji with more. The action plans of the nation's education and employment ministries for the coming year focus on nurturing creative talent and building a society where workers are rewarded for their skills and not their credentials. For teenagers, the government aims to further promote its so-called free semester program, whereby middle school students are exempt from exams for a semester to give them time to enjoy other pursuits. As of 2014, 25 percent of middle schools nationwide had implemented the program. The ministry aims to increase that to 70 percent by the end of this year and to eventually expand it to every middle school by 2016. Our ministry is helping facilitate the necessary procedures so that every sector of society, including economic, social and cultural institutions, will open their doors to teenagers during their free semesters. For the nation's young people, the government will increase the number of specialized vocational schools to help them find careers at an earlier age. The government will also encourage companies to list specific qualification requirements on their job postings so that job seekers and employers can avoid a mismatch. At the same time, the government hopes to increase women's economic participation in society. The women's employment rate in Korea is still lower than the OECD average. But the Gender Equality Ministry has plans for bringing the rate up. The ministry plans to pressure companies to give a year of automatic childcare leave following three months of maternity leave without having to apply. Although we cannot force companies to adopt the system, we will try to give incentive to companies that implement it. There are plans to set up new career centers for women with a variety of diverse career training courses. 
The training programs are expected to benefit over 17,000 women. The government will also increase the quantity and quality of daycare services, and the nation's daycare centers will be overhauled to follow stricter evaluation standards. Park ji Arirang News. And the government's goals don't end there. It also wants to do more to promote and celebrate the Korean culture. The culture ministry says the key to doing that is to give people greater access to arts and cultural activities. Our Connie Lee tells us more. Having a happy life through arts and culture. That's what Korea's Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism is promoting in their official plans for the new year. The ministry announced Thursday that one of its major goals is to add more avenues where people can enjoy the arts, especially on the nation's designated Culture Day. Despite efforts to promote this day in its first run in 2014, we found out that the awareness level of Culture Day only stands at 30 percent. So this year, we plan to bring arts and culture to the people, especially those outside the city or in rural areas. Culture Day falls on the last Wednesday of every month, and on this day you can get free admission or discounts to museums and galleries, and even discounts to concerts or theaters. And this year, more venues, at least 1,800 nationwide, will be participating in this monthly campaign. Another goal for Korea is to boost its national image by promoting its arts and culture to the world. According to an annual index of 50 developed countries, Korea ranks 27th in terms of national brand, with people around the world having more positive perceptions of Germany than any other country. One way Korea will try to improve its image is by joining this year's Milano Expo, a six-month affair in the Italian city where 145 countries will gather to showcase ideas on food, science and technology. The ministry also plans to spend more on Korea's tourism industry, from $22 billion in 2014 to $24 billion this year. With the new plans now set to go, the government can now only hope that they will contribute to the people's happiness this year. Connie Lee, Arirang News, Sejong. Korea Central Bank Governor Lee ju yeol is taking a step back from the possibility of further rate cuts, expressing concerns about the country's snowballing household debt. Speaking at a meeting held by the Seoul Foreign Correspondents Club on Thursday, he said the bank will strive to ensure financial stability as the amount of household debt has been rising at a rapid pace since last October. He added the central bank will take time to gauge the impact of the two previous rate cuts in the second half of last year. He also said the central bank's 3.4 percent growth forecast for this year is largely in line with the country's potential growth rate. World leaders and businessmen gathered in the Swiss Alpine city of Davos on Wednesday, kicking off this year's World Economic Forum. Their Chinese Premier Li Keqiang said that China's slowing growth isn't too much to worry about. Our Song Jisan has the story. The downward pressure is there. But Beijing will aim for quality and continued growth in the long term. Those were the words of the Prime Minister of the world's fastest growing economy, after the economy failed to meet the government target for the first time. The Chinese economy logged a 7.4 percent growth rate in 2014, the lowest in 24 years. Seeking to assure global leaders that China will bring more opportunities to the world if it continues to grow at a medium to fast speed for the next couple of decades, Li reiterated that he will pursue a prudent monetary policy and a proactive fiscal policy. It must be noted that the moderation of the growth rate in China reflects a profound adjustment in the world economy, and it is also consistent with the law of economics. More importantly, we have made further progress on structural reforms. Needless to say, the Chinese economy will continue to face substantial downward pressure in 2015. As the world's second largest economy sought to assure investors, the world's largest economy is picking up pace. In a survey by PricewaterhouseCoopers conducted before the forum kicked off, CEOs attending the meeting indicated that the U.S. now seems a more attractive market than China by 38 to 34 percent. This marks the first time the U.S. has come out on top since the firm started conducting the poll five years ago. 
With the IMF having lowered its global growth outlook to 3.5 percent this year, from an earlier forecast of 3.8 percent, deflation in the eurozone, structural reforms, and income inequality will be among the major issues discussed at the Davos Forum this year. Song Jisun, Arirang News. So gone are the days of just paying for things with cash or credit cards. Now you can carry all the money you need for the day on a chip or in a barcode in your smartphone if you feel like it. And small firms are looking to step into this financial technology market, but complex regulations are holding them back. Our Kim Ji-hyun reports. Touch here, touch there. Try taking public transportation here in Korea, and it won't take you long to see commuters simply placing a card on a reader for hopping on the bus or on the subway. The RF, or radio frequency card, enables users to pay for their fares without ever having to open their wallets, showing how much Koreans prefer faster and easier ways of payment. And because of this, startup companies like Touchworks are trying to introduce a mobile payment method as an extension of its current services. The company's touching surface allows users to accumulate membership points through an app without having to search through their device for a barcode. Around 550,000 users are currently using the touching app, with more than 1,000 stores nationwide participating in the service. Touchworks' plans to expand into the mobile payment market is in line with an IT trend in Korea called fintech, a combination of the words financial and technology. The trend is changing the way we pay or transfer money and creating business opportunities. However, despite the potential for growth, local startups in the field struggle to overcome cumbersome government regulations. The rules are so stifling that they can prevent startups from getting off the ground at all. For instance, as it stands now, companies need a capital requirement of 1 billion Korean won, around 925,000 U.S. dollars, if they want to become an e-commerce firm. It's a problem because while a startup might have the right ideas and technology, a lack of significant significant capital means they aren't even getting past square one. To give small firms a fairer shot, Korea's Financial Services Commission says it's going to announce deregulatory measures by the end of this month. The commission is expected to lower the capital requirement to some $460,000, half the current requirement. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. Taking aim at the low end of the market, Samsung Electronics has launched a new smartphone in Korea that will retail for under 500 U.S. dollars. You can now buy the Galaxy A5 from Korea's three major telecom carriers, SK Telecom, KT and LG U+. It costs around $450, and that price is about 40 percent cheaper than the company's flagship S-Series. Despite its cheaper price, though, the model still boasts a fully metal body and features a 5-megapixel camera, along with a 5-inch high-definition Super AMOLED display. The Galaxy A7, another model in Samsung's low-end lineup, is scheduled to be launched next week. Samsung is hoping its new models will challenge the rise of lower-end Chinese smartphones. Starting new businesses with creative ideas and launching startups is at the heart of President Park Geun-hye's creative economy drive. And now government support has pushed the number of startups to a record high. Korea's Small and Medium Businesses Administration said Thursday that the number of startups in Korea had risen to 30,021 in January from 2000 just 16 years ago. 63 of the startups have risen to number one in terms of market share in their respective sectors. The revenue generated by startups now accounts for some 14 percent of Korea's GDP. Over the past few days, we've been taking a look at Korea's startup fever. But today, we turn our focus to Israel, a relatively small country in terms of geography and population, but a world leader when it comes to fostering startups. And our Connie Kim reports on how this became possible for Israel. Israel has over 60 IT startups listed on the Nasdaq. That's more than the combined total number of startups from Europe, China, Japan, and Korea. And this comes on the back of the country's strong R&D gene. Scientists and technicians per capita in Israel are nearly double those in the U.S., 
helping Israel's innovative city, Tel Aviv, become the second best startup ecosystem in the world after California's Silicon Valley. Experts say the country's unique chutzpah culture, or pioneer spirit, also plays an important role in creating venture capital buzz. But helping to weave these elements together is the government. Through seed investments, it's been supporting the core technology of startups, hard and costly to build up, but regarded as critical for development. They are heavily investing in this very, very risky stage where usually uh, commercial organizations are quite averse to uh, investing in this area. Israel's first venture capital firm was established in the mid-1980s. By 1993, the government collaborated with the private sector to form Yozma, one of the country's largest venture capital funds. Luring in foreign venture capitalists by offering tax incentives and doubling investment through a government matching program, Yozma managed over 220 million U.S. dollars in its three funds. Israel's venture capital funds take bold steps in making risky investments, but that's not the case in Korea, where investors have high expectations on retrieving the money they put in. Creating a favorable environment for new businesses, Yozma also helped to connect and oversee the acquisition of local startups by global corporations such as Microsoft, Johnson & Johnson and Cisco. In 2013, the acquisitions and IPOs of Israeli companies far exceeded $6 billion, while startups totaled more than $2 billion in venture funding. With the right conditions to flourish, market watchers say there's a good chance the next Facebook or Google will emerge from Israel. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Back here in Korea, the Supreme Court has upheld a nine-year prison term and a seven-year ban on serving in parliament for the first sitting lawmaker to be convicted of treason since the 1980s. At the close of the 17-month trial, former Unified Progressive Party member Lee seok was found guilty of instigating a rebellion. Among members of a secretive pro-North Korea group called the Revolutionary Organization, he was acquitted of charges that he had plotted a rebellion against the South Korean government in the event of war with North Korea. He is a former lawmaker and member of the now dissolved UPP, which was indicted on charges of conspiring with members of the underground group. And Korea's communications regulator says the controversial taxi booking app Uber has violated the law. The Korea Communications Commission said Thursday the Korean branch of Uber Technologies failed to report its location service. The KCC says it will now report Uber Korea to the prosecution. The Seoul Metropolitan Government previously declared the ride-sharing app illegal and is offering a $1,000 reward to those who report vehicles they use the Uber service. Uber has not yet offered a response to the KCC's decision. Seeing is believing, or so the saying goes, but the works of one artist with an exhibition currently in Seoul will make you wonder if your eyes are telling you the truth. Our Im Yuni takes us on a colorful trip to a surreal world. A shirt billowing in the wind like a sail, tucked into not a pair of pants, but a building. An unexpected sight that makes you second guess your eyes and question reality. This is surrealism, a style of art that coerces contradictory ideas and images onto one canvas, resulting in a dream-like reality. Or is it a reality-like dream? Painter-sculptor Vladimir Kush is one of the leading surrealists of the 21st century, recognized for his impeccable ability to bring the unexpected to each of his works. Vladimir Kush is often considered the Dali of Russia, 
and Dali is one of the most recognized surrealist artists of all time. However, the difference between the two is that Kush portrays positive images, a brighter side to fairy tales, whereas surrealism traditionally uses dark, shattered images. Kush has a very witty sense about him, so all ages, even children, enjoy the stories that come to life in his work. And each one of Kush's masterpieces leaves plenty of room for the unseen. He paints a sense of mystery with each brushstroke, like looking into a storybook. But there's something also familiar about each work. Kush believes that the metaphor is not limited to our language, but is something that connects the unconnected in our everyday lives. It's an idea he's coined as metaphorical realism, and it's evident throughout his pieces. But because of this bridge that joins two distant ideas, the canvas also opens up to endless possibilities. It's a story ready to be written, no matter how far-fetched it may be. Korea's up-and-coming poet Kim Kyung-ju gives his take on the whimsical works of Kush in his poem, Dear, inspired by the luminous painting behind the trees. 사슴, 난 바다 속에 산다는 바다 사슴을 알아요. 1년에 한 번만 수면으로 올라온다는 바다 사슴. 언젠간 나는 바다 사슴의 등에 올라타고 사라진 엄마를 찾으러 갈 거예요. 엄마는 어느 날 밤, 코와 이마에 뿔이 생긴 후 무서워서 깊은 바다로 들어갔대요. People think surrealism is the opposite of realism, that it's very dramatic, avoids all reality. But Kush disagrees and uses his works of surrealism to illustrate his idea of metaphorical realism. He uses a metaphor to connect seemingly unrelated, opposing ideas or objects. If you look at this painting, it looks very unrealistic, but it contains elements that are all part of our real world. These walls are lined with windows, looking into distant lands, lands that may not be as far off as you think. And although every inch of each canvas is covered in surreal images and designs, Kush has created a blank canvas, ready for our wildest imaginations. Im Yoon Hee, Arirang News. Welcome back, I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. There has been a heavy snow advisory issued in some parts of Gangwon-do and Gyeongsangbuk-do provinces and it's snowing at the moment and it's expected to continue until this evening. Meanwhile, the rest of the nation can expect a cloudy day with a bit of a fog here and there and due to the remaining moisture from the rain that we had last night. Now, these regions can expect the mild temperatures as well, especially during the peak of the day. And we are expecting higher highs than yesterday, almost reaching up into the teens. Now, this spring-like weather will continue all throughout the week until Sunday evening when another round of precipitation is expected here in Seoul and in Gyeonggi-do province and then expanding nationwide by Monday. Now to our readings for today, Seoul will peak up to 8 this afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan will be higher at 7 and 9 degrees. Moving over to other regions such as Jeju Island gets up high at 9 as well. Tokdo is chilly at 4 while Mount Kungang drops low to negative 5 degrees. Well, that's all for now, Michelle Park. And here's a look at the weather conditions around the world.
All right, for those of you in Korea, don't let that gloomy weather bring you down your day, though. Well, have a wonderful afternoon, and we'll see you right back here for our next newscast at 6 p.m. Korea time.